majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God. Oh Lord God Almighty. Thank you. That was great. How many of you was the first time you'd ever heard that song? Wow. It has been around for years. I just don't understand that. But no, seriously, we are going to do another oldie, but it has a new twist on it. I was raised, I was raised in a Christian home, fortunate, blessed to be able to call my mom and dad literally saints. My dad is gone, my mom is still living. And they were prayer warriors. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. Now my mother prays for all of her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. Um, they taught me about this amazing grace that we have in Jesus. But somewhere along the line, I picked up some baggage. I picked up some baggage of legalism. And it took me until maybe 15 years ago to shed that baggage. And when I heard this, the second portion, the chorus of this, of this old, old song that you'll all know because it's on the radio quite a bit. They sing it at funerals. The message of this song, though, is amazing. But when you combine the words of the chorus, my chains are gone. Those chains, my chains, not of sin, but the legalism was a huge part of sin in my life. And those chains are gone. They're just out. So don't ever think that because we've got Jesus, we still don't have baggage. Because we do. So let those chains go. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good. To me, his word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion.
portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing gr grace. Unending love, amazing grace. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. What a Savior, he's my 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 Savior, you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy. Are worthy. You 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 are worthy. All right, since we're all standing, let's welcome each other this morning. And if you see someone you don't know, tell them hi. I didn't mark my music that I had to transpose, so that's what happened. I'm sorry. So the first thing we want to do um, before we do birthdays and everything is we celebrate Veterans Day on Friday. And so do we have any veterans in here? If you would just stand on up. We just want to recognize you. All right, if you, you can sit down if you like. Um, you see these men and women. Um, if, you, if you're sitting around them... Um, <coughs> and they're okay, comfortable with that. If you could just 
put your hand on one of them. And I just want to pray for for our uh, veterans. Uh, so would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just praise you. Uh, we praise you for these men and women who who answered the call to serve this country. And so, Lord, we just we praise you for them. And, Lord, as we're celebrating them and we're thanking them as they are deserving, um, too often our, our country didn't do that for them. And so, Lord, we praise you for it. And so, Lord, I ask that if they are dealing with anything, any baggage, any 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 dreams that are nightmares, Lord, that you would take those things from them, that they would know that they are loved by at least this family of God, and that we, we thank you for them. And so, Lord, thank you, because they did what so many of us, did, we didn't do. Mm-hmm. So we just praise you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm. And, and we're just, we do this, this is kind of our custom to, to um, do birthdays every week. And so did anyone have a birthday that we can celebrate um, from last Monday to today? Anyone? Oh, it's Ed. Huh? That's why you don't tell kids anything. Anyone else? Oh, you're a loner. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. So we don't. We never ask the lady her um, uh, her age. So we're not going to ask you your age. No. I'm just, what's your age? <laughs> oh my. Yay. Well, God bless you. I pray that this year is 86, and it's a great year, and that your wife will take you out to lunch and pamper you, and we could, we could, we could ask for the moon, right? <laughs> so God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about anniversaries? Anyone celebrating an anniversary that we could stand on up? Stand on up? So how many years? 42. 42, all right. A story that goes with this, and uh, so I should all tell you, because you're probably wondering, is Les my wife? And he is not. <laughs> he, he's nowhere close to my wife. My wife is, is a lady who is very blessed and loves her job, and uh, she works in an accounting department for a firm there in Bozeman, but they treat her really good and have for many years. She has allowed me to come here. Uh, it's not that I don't like the cold. I just don't have to be there, so I would prefer not to be here. So I'm here. Uh, but she is going to join me for a period of time after Christmas. I'll go home at Christmas. But, uh, no, I indeed have a, a very, very, very wonderful wife. Thank you. Praise the Lord. So, in how many years? Ten years? All right. Well, we're going to celebrate. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. So my prayer is that for 43 and for 11, that you are blessed this year and that this time of awareness would not be that far as the saying goes, the absence makes the heart go fonder, right? And that as you guys have your first year down here, that you are blessed and that God richly takes care of you this year so that Christ can show through your marriage. So God bless you. Thank you for letting us be a part of it. So as Jim comes on up, um, so if this is your, what? I, I, yes, right now. Uh, see every time <laughs> no that's good because i usually forgot so all last year i forgot every single week um so if you're here for the first time or you're back down for the first uh you know you finally got back here for some reason you take this long to get away from the snow um if you would just stand on up and give us your first and where you're from that's all we ask if you don't want to that's fine too um but you miss out on the prize so. 
They popped right up. <laughs> All right, we'll start over here. Back there. Just first and last, our uh, first name and where you're from. We're the Cameron family. I'm Greg and this is Kenny. Uh, originally from Nashville, Tennessee. This is our third season in Portside. Uh, first time here. Uh, we've been attending another church here locally. And, um, well, we'll steal you. What a, what a great place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already bought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, God, God bless you guys and thank you for being here. All right. So we'll start here and then we'll work over back. Yeah, uh, she has a, a beautiful place and a beautiful heart. I mean, it's like, yeah. so, welcome back, Lynn. I'm Bobby Joe. I'm from Harvard, Montana. I've been still learning what to do here. Okay, well, just to give you a heads up, the other Montanas are over here. So, um, so if you want to feel comfortable over there, if you want to. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right. Oh, okay, they're spreading. All right, right. Uh, Phil and Cindy Stagg, and we are from Michigan. All right. Yeah. Welcome, Phil and Cindy. All right. How about? Uh, <laughs> All right, right. Tong and Jocelyn Tao from Wisconsin. All right. And then right back there. Jim Grantley, Washington. Welcome. Dude. All right. So you didn't get yourself set up. Okay. Um, real quick, so today we have a special guest speaker. His name's Jimmy Meeks. He's from Texas. We have a, I have a Texan on my left. I got a Texan on my right. Um, and I got to get out of here. Um, <laughs> so, but he uh, came out and he did two seminars for us yesterday, a, a, a church leadership, um, security team awareness, active response seminar. Very good. A lot of good information. Um, and then a ladies seminar afterwards. He gave us all his notes from the ladies' seminar. So if you're a lady, um, they're, they're out there on the information table. Go and grab it. It's just some information. Be aware. It's you know, the main thing, right? I, the thing he kept saying again and again is take away the opportunity. And I thought that, that is just, if you just remember that one thing, take away the opportunity for thieves or vandals or bad guys. That's great. So it's out there on there. And then, Jim. Oh, I do have another one. All right. So in a couple of weeks, we have Thanksgiving potluck. Um, so many people, we started this because so many people are away from families at this time. And so we are the family of God. And so we celebrate everything as much as we can together. And so if you want to be a part of that Thanksgiving potluck, it's going to be on a Thursday. It's going to be on the 24th at 1 o'clock, okay? Sometimes people don't know when Thanksgiving is, okay? I'm, I'm not even joking. It's coming on a Thursday okay. this That year. and Easter. It's on a Thursday. Yeah, it's usually on Thursdays, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. All right, so, um, so I'm going to pass the, these around. If you want to be a part of that and you want to bring something, you don't have to bring something. You can bring yourself. We always have plenty of food, but if you want to bring something, uh, you just put down your name, all right? We always bring a ham. Because I love ham, I love and ham. I love after ham, and I love ham mm -hmm. through Christmas, and, and ham, ham every day. So, um, so if you want to bring that, deviled eggs or angel eggs, whatever you want to call um, bring those and bring those and bring those. We will find places for them, usually in the stomach. All right. Okay. <laughs> Am I on? Okay. You all know what this is. I, was, I should have asked you first. Did you come this morning with Jesus? Or did Jesus bring you here? Yes. yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. If you see this in your bulletin, uh, you want to get to know the president. What do you know the president? The pastor. <laughs> I'm trying to get fired. 
fill it out and put it in the offering plate. And this one in there, this is a list of all the events we're going to be having this, uh, this year. Next Sunday, I believe it is. Uh, no, it's the uh, November 23rd, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the QIA. It's our Thanksgiving Eve celebration. What do we have there? Pie? Pie. pie and with whipped cream and more pie. Pumpkin and apple. Pumpkin and apple. Okay. Come and hear the uh, gospel vocals of Wade Hammond. How many have heard him? He is really good. I really enjoy him. And got a good uh, testimony too. So come on out. But put this on your refrigerator. If you already have one, give it to your friends. And... Yeah, this uh, this um, Tuesday tops me uh, t the tops meet at 7 a.m. in the fellowship hall next door, and the ladies' prayer is at 3 p.m. at Pastor Jeremiah's house, Marika's house. They share it. Um, apologetics class at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays in that little classroom over there. Pastor teaches that. If you haven't been to it or heard, it's really something to to see uh, to hear good. Ladies Quilting meets on Thursdays at 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Friday is a teen rec night and uh, Saturday we have a fellowship breakfast at Karen's. We all meet there. We, well, some of us do. And uh, have breakfast. That's why it's called breakfast meeting. <laughs> I'm expecting you to fire me anytime. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> No, okay. That's all I have. Well, there's one more here. What is it? Oh, I already read that one. Uh, tonight, fill uh, it in the sanctuary here. Uh, a night of worship tonight, 6 p.m., right here in the sanctuary. Come on out and enjoy. That's all I have. Anybody else want to share anything? Yes. Faye, do you want to? No, I'm probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Next Saturday night is ladies night here in the church and we're going to be having a bake sale for the kids. So Mary Kay, one of our ladies, is baking sugar cookies all week. So we ask that the ladies come and help decorate them. So it's just a fun night of decorating cookies. Four o'clock next Saturday. Okay. Marty, you shared something earlier. Did you wanna would you like to? Two for three dollars or a dozen for fifteen. And uh, I'm taking orders uh, today if you'd like, and uh, I'll give you my email and phone number as well so you can get a hold of me. Thank you. Uh, red traditional, red pork uh, traditional, uh, jalapeno cheese, and then I have the, the dessert tamales, uh, uh, cream corn, and raisin. Okay? You're going to have to try that. Okay, thank you. That's all we have. Let's, uh, let's go before the Lord. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your mighty love. Father, we thank you for the grace that we uh, uh, that surpasses understanding. Father, what a mighty God you are to love us uh, even the way we are. Father, we, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us, gave us life for each and every one of us. And now as we get into the rest of the service, we ask that you would bless uh, Jimmy as he comes forward and preaches. Lord, I heard him this morning, and I'm looking forward to hearing it all again. Thank you so much for him. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. So like I said, Jimmy Meeks, he's from Texas. Come on up. And I just appreciate him because this is the first Sunday I haven't preached since last January. So <laughs> I just thank him. So there you go. Your congregation wishes you would skip more often. You keep saying that. Don't, don't introduce people like that. You set them up. <laughs> First time he hasn't preached in a while, the con a big thank you card they're going to send you, Jeremiah. How about that? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. My name is Jimmy Mix. I live in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. We did a seminar here yesterday, a couple of seminars. I was a police officer for 35 years, five years in Oklahoma, and 30 years in Texas. And I've been preaching the gospel. I grew up in Arkansas, started preaching in 1973, but I'm from Texas. Everybody know where Texas is? 
stayed on bottom, holds up the other 49. I'm sure you've heard of it. But I was born and raised in Arkansas. How many know where Arkansas is? Oh, yeah. Now, I'm doing a lot better since my sister and I got a divorce. <clears throat> Things have been looking up. I got my first pair of shoes, got some new teeth. I'm really excited about life. All right. Well, I have a long drive, so this is going to be a short sermon. I was looking on my Siri maps, and it's a 15-hour drive, so I bet I can get to Tucson by dark. So I'm not going to keep you here very long. But I do want to give you what I've been given. This is the same marriage, a uh, marriage, same message. All this marriage talk got me thinking. I've been married 45 years, whereas my wife would say 45 years too long. So anyway, it won't be a long sermon. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke 15. I've been sharing this same message since around 1987. I've shared it in hundreds of services across the country, running around, and people have a very difficult time with this message. Luke 15. There we have a story of Jesus telling about three lost items. Remember? The man that lost a sheep, the woman that lost a coin, the father that lost a son. Let me just give you a couple things I've observed over the years. I've been, uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't mean that I'm anyone significant or special. It just happens to be my story. But I've been in a lot of churches across this country, from Miami to Seattle, from Bangor, Maine to Los Angeles. I was up a few months ago up in Minneapolis riding around and with the Minneapolis police officers, uh, ministering to them and, and working in the George Floyd zone when that terrible tragedy happens. And I just spent a lot of time with a lot of people, especially Christian people, and I have become convinced of something. There is a lot of confusion about God. A lot of confusion. And that confusion has also crept into the church. This is just my experience. It may not be yours. But I've noticed a lot of people who profess faith in Christ, a lot of people have difficulty with God in knowing what He's really like. And there's a lot of confusion in the world. I mean, we have more religions uh, that are just coming out of the woodwork, from Scientology to New Ageism, uh, Hinduism and Judaism. Of course, they've been around forever. And, uh, the Islam, Islamic religion, and of course the Christian faith. The Christian faith, you may not know it, but the Christian faith is no longer the world's fastest growing religion. Did you know that? By 2050, the Muslim Islam religion will be the most powerful religion or the fastest growing religion in the world. A lot of disturbing things happening in the world of Christianity. Did you know 7 out of 10 young people leave church when they graduate high school? Everything we do for them, we let... We sing their music, we entertain them, uh, we have all kinds of stuff for them. In spite of that, over seven, closer to eight out of ten, when they graduate high school, they also graduate church, and they quit going. A lot of people are abandoning the faith. I read stories all the time of well-known people, musicians, and even ministers who abandon the faith. There's just a lot of confusion about God. Now, please forgive my voice. I've been sick for about a week or two. I just got back from Wuhan, China. And uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I, I've had a hard time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some water down here. It's got a shot of bourbon in it, and it's been making me feel a lot better. I'm just kidding. I, don't, I know nothing about the Alliance Christian denomination. For all I know, you're a bunch of drunks, for all I know. I don't know what you do. <laughs> but you do seem like a lot of happy people. I didn't know there was a courtside Arizona. If there, is there anything big around here? Is there another town? I mean, it's like nothing, nothing, rocks, right? <laughs> you have lots of rocks. Well, we have a lot of that in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, a lot of rocks in human form. <laughs> Luke 15, look at this now. Let me show you this, okay? Verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now think about that for a moment. Before Jesus tells these three stories of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, you need to know who he's telling this story to because I want to I wanna emphasize the story of the prodigal son. You've probably heard it a thousand times, but I want you to see some things about it. But it's really important to understand who Jesus is talking to. These are sinners. These are the outcasts. These are the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the drunkards, the sex addicts, the dope addicts. These are the ones who in their minds had a belief that God just did not want to have anything to do with them. 
That's what religion teaches people, that God is just not interested in your life. So the people listening to Jesus would have been utterly and completely stunned at what they're hearing because what he's telling them is that there is a God who is interested in all of the details of your life and everything about you. So he tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then he gets to the story of the prodigal son. Let's just read it right quick, all right? I think it uh, starts in verse 12. In verse 11, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living or wasteful living. The son takes the inheritance, he goes to a foreign land, and he blows it all. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in want and need. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And this young boy would have been a young Jewish boy. And there would have been nothing more disgraceful than having a job where you feed swine. Where you feed pigs, an unclean animal. Verse 16. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to party. That's what that word merry means. Now, again, remember who Jesus is talking to. The outcast, the rejects. The kind of people that you point at and tell your children, whatever you do when you grow up, do, do not be like them. But there's something else you need to understand about the story. Jesus is wanting to show you and I and the people that are listening, he's wanting to show them what God is like. His character, his personality, if you will. His character traits, his nature. That's something people have a very hard time with. And I'm going to tell you something. In my experience, in thousands of sermons... Church people are so, I heard the sister talking about it earlier, it's as if she read my notes, which I don't have any, but as if she did. Legalism is probably the biggest threat to most churches. Every church has its little rule. You know, something they're big on. Something you can't do. Somewhere you can't go. Something you're not supposed to believe. You've got to meet on Saturday, says one denomination. Oh, no, you've got to meet on Tuesday nights between 6 and 7, or whatever. Every church, every denomination seems to have its own little man-made rules. You ever notice that? Something they're big on. Uh, I'm a Baptist, and uh, they're very big on making sure that women are not behind the pulpit, even though we've got a bunch of screwed-up men who are. <laughs> I probably shouldn't go too far there, but I keep forgetting we're live-streaming here, so you no longer have a local service that goes all over the world. <laughs> but that's what religion does. Religion always has a bunch of rules and regulations, precepts and principles, do's and don'ts, and thou shalt and thou shalt not. The way you ought to look, the way you ought to dress, or not dress, the way you not look. There's just always something. And in the midst of it all, it becomes very bewildering and perplexing and confusing, confusing, confusing about God. And Jesus is trying to convey to us here a few things. I'm going to just take three things that he wants you to see about God. Because the father in this story represents the heart of God. And the prodigal son represents you and I. He takes his share of the inheritance. He goes off into a foreign country and blows it all on wine, women, and song. Alcohol, drugs, prostitutes. He's broke. He spends all of his money. And to make matters worse, a famine hits the land. <clears throat> and then he has to get a job feeding pigs. This guy is at the bottom of the barrel at the end of his rope. And he thinks to himself one day, if I could just go home to my father and be as a hired servant, at least I'd have something to wear, something to eat, and some shelter from the storm. So he starts going home. And here's when we begin to see the heart of his father and the heart of our heavenly father. Now please try to envision this. Picture this in your mind. 
The father's on his front porch, and when he sees this son coming, we are told that he ran toward the son, fell on him, and kissed him. Now, time out. Hold on a second. Remember, this is a picture of God. When he sees that son coming home, the father runs down the road, tackles him like a linebacker hitting a halfback, takes him to the ground, and begins to kiss him repeatedly. And Jesus wants you to see that that is the attitude of our Heavenly Father toward us. You ever see God as someone who says, I sure do enjoy holding you. I sure do. You ever see God as somebody who just enjoys loving on you? Not as somebody who's trying to get you to tithe more, come to church more, be more active, do this or do that. With an endless list of demands, do you ever see your father as someone who just wants to hold you? Jesus looked out over Jerusalem one time and wept and said, How often I've wanted to just gather you like a mother hen does her chicks and just hold you under my wings. God loves to love on people. Number one, the, the one thing you've got to get, and it's simple, we're taught it in vacation Bible school when we're in the first and second grade, but somehow or another it begins to elude our memory and escape our minds. But you need to hear this. And I share this everywhere, and people have a very hard time with it. But listen carefully. I need to show you this about your Heavenly Father. The God of the Bible, your Heavenly Father, is a ferocious, flaming, fiery, fierce, passionate, wild, steaming, hot, romantic, adventurous lover. <laughs> hard to accept, is it not? Most of you don't know what to do. You look like you froze over. The frozen chosen. Well, you don't know that because, well, number one, and I don't want to make you feel bad, but you haven't spent a lot of time in this. You spend a lot of time on the Internet. You spend a lot of time texting and Facebooking and messaging and keeping up with your favorite football team. But you know something? The more you study of the Scripture and the more experience you have of God, you come to realize our Father is, as Elvis might sing, a hunk of hunk of burning love. Your Father loves you passionately. Now, let me ask you this. I asked it. Everywhere I go, I asked it this morning. How many of you think, boy, it's just a miracle that he loves us? Amen? Why would you think that? You think that because you haven't studied your Bible. It's no miracle that he loves you. It would be a miracle if he did not love you because God is love. Think now. You look at it that way because of human love. There are people that are difficult to love. Those of us who have been married, we celebrated you, but you know, it ain't all... I mean, you're here and she's in Montana. I couldn't do that, brother. I've been gone a week from my wife and Jeremiah's starting to look pretty. I need to get home. Does anybody know what I mean? A month? Are you kidding me? No way. It's no miracle God loves you. Listen, it would be a miracle if he did not love you because he would have to act contrary to his nature. God is love. He has no problem loving an Osama bin Laden, a Joe Biden, or you. He loves the Democrats? Yes, he does. If he's having any trouble with anybody, it's probably with the right-wingers these days, but that's another sermon. You would think, and I threw this in the last service, let me just share something with you. When the right doesn't win an election, God does not fall off his throne. Give me a break. What is wrong with all the right-wingers in this country? Especially those who profess faith in Christ. I well, can't stand Biden. I can't stand Harris. can't stand the left wing. Well, listen, God has never been about politics to begin with. He's about his church, his kingdom, period. And it doesn't matter. We've had 46 presidents, and not a one of them has ever done any permanent good for this country. Not one. We've had thousands of senators, hundreds of senators, thousands of congressmen and congresswomen, and none of them have ever gone to work for us. When are we going to wake up and realize the answer is not in the White House, but God's house? We are the city on a hill. We are the light of the world. I don't give a flying flip who they put in office. It doesn't matter. No matter who we've put there, it's never lasted. We've never had any good change. We are as divided now as we have been since the Civil War, and we will never go back. And it is not time to panic, cry, and worry, and gripe about the left. It is time to just be God's people. To be captivated by the love and the heart of our Father and to share that. And beloved, next thing you know, we will fool around and convert the whole country. We're never going to force people into righteousness. We're not going to do it. 
We're not going to do it. If you really want to start becoming like Jesus, why don't you spend more time with drunkards and prostitutes? Quit saying, well, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. You don't love the sinner. If you did, you'd spend more time with them. You'd spend more time. You'd spend more time at the bars. Well, we're not supposed to go there. He did. The Savior in whom you put your trust hung around with drunkards, prostitutes, and spent time at the bar. You can't just say you love the sinner but hate the sin if you don't actually go out and love the sinner. And with the heart of the Father, when you begin to find out how he... Fi Listen, this is God's strong, emotional, passionate feelings toward you. He wants to take you to the ground and hold you and kiss you all over because he's a loving God. Now, how do I know he loves me? Is it because I drive a nice car? You'll hear people say, well, the Lord loves me. He has blessed me with a new car. You should never say that. You can get a new car without God. All you need is credit. Will you quit saying he blessed you with a new car? Or he blessed you with a promotion? Or he blessed you with more money? Listen, Bill Gates has $150 billion in the bank and he says there is no God. The possessions you have, the car you drive, the money you've got, the house you live in, has nothing whatsoever to do with the love of God. The biggest devils in town have those things. Most of the wealthy, rich millionaires and billionaires could care less about God. How do we measure God's love? Listen, here's how I know He loves me. I know He loves me because of the bloody, bruised, beaten, battered, broken body of Jesus crucified to the cross. I know He loves me because He gave me the most expensive thing, quote-unquote, He could. He gave me the life of His Son. The cross is the evidence of God's love, not your car, cash, or cottage. Are you hearing me? The Scripture says, here it is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and gave His Son for us. The Scripture says, God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were His enemies, Christ died for us. Jesus is the evidence of God's love me. No, God loves me. Nobody can stand at the foot of the cross and look up at the scarred, broken, torn, sweaty, bloody face of Jesus. Nobody can look at that and ask, does God love me? Jesus is the proof of God's love. I may drive a car that doesn't get me out of the garage. I may live in a house where the foundation is cracked and the roof is leaking. I may have a job that does not meet ends meet. However, ends meet. However, that has nothing to do with the Father's love. I know He loves me because of the cross. He loves you. Would you agree with me that God loves Jesus? He said, this is my beloved Son whom I love. Well, Jesus said in John, God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. You ever think about that? We all know he loves Jesus. The pagans know that. The Bible says he loves you as much as he loves his only son. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. The second thing we see in this is that the Father is very forgiving. The Son just comes back and says, I have sinned against heaven in you. Now listen to this. The Father doesn't even bring up what the Son has been doing wrong. I would have been like, wait a minute, Son. I've been following you on Twitter and Facebook. You've been spending all your money on prostitutes and drugs and alcohol and all this other stuff. Do you have any of my inheritance left? Not so easy here. The Father does not even bring up the issue of his sins. The Son confesses, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you. And in the moment there's confession, in the same moment there's complete forgiveness. There's not a thing, and I guarantee you, I've preached this sermon, I've long since lost count. Thousands of times ago, in every audience, there are going to be men and women who are plagued by something they've done that nobody knows about. There's always a man in the audience that was unfaithful to his wife, or vice versa, or parents who have failed, or children who have rebelled. There's always people out there that are struck by something that has happened to them. There's always, think about this. According to Billy Graham's grandson who researches this, in every congregation, 20% of the people in there are survivors of sex abuse. So we have 60 people in here today, close to 20. I'm going to single anybody out. I'm just saying that those things have terrible, traumatic effects on people. We have over 1,500 people sexually assaulted in this country every day. 
every day, every year, 464,000 people sexually assaulted. Every 98 seconds, an American is assaulted. And 20% of the people, probably even in this room, are victims of that. And that happened to some of you years ago. I've heard stories all over this country. I myself as a child, me, I remember when I was a kid being kidnapped and assaulted. It was a terrible thing. There's no telling how that scarred me. And sometimes that leaves guilt and condemnation. Or you think it was my fault. Or maybe you thought it was your fault. Or you just feel so dirty. But the truth of the matter is, you did nothing wrong. And even if you did something wrong, when all is said and done, you've got a Father who has made forgiveness possible through the shed blood of Christ. There is nothing you have done, said, or thought that cannot be washed away by the blood of the Son. In Him we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. God loves to forgive. He delights in forgiveness. He delights in mercy. Do you know that? We often delight in somebody's demise when they've done something wrong. He deserved it. He had it coming. What if we all got what we deserved? We would all fry like in hell, like fry like bacon. If we all got, the Bible says in Psalms, He does not deal with us as our sins deserve, for He knows our frame that we are but dust. But He's a forgiving God. He loves us. He forgives. He also celebrates over us, thirdly. <coughs> you ever see God as somebody who celebrates you? There's a beautiful verse. I love to read it out of Zephaniah. This is the Old Testament, Israelites. <coughs> Think how much more true it is now that we live on this side of the cross. Listen to what the prophet Zephaniah, God said through him about his people. He said, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Do you ever see yourself as somebody that God just takes a lot of pleasure in and he sings and rejoices and the word in the Hebrew there means to leap and twirl about that he leaps and twirls about celebrates you that he actually dances over you you just turn God on it's kind of new to hear that in it we're not used to that people have a very difficult time I think people have a very difficult difficult time with the fact that God is just that good he's that loving He's that forgiving. And he's, the son comes home, no mention of his sins. They kill a fatted calf. They put a robe on him. What could that robe signify? You know what that robe signifies? The Bible speaks of the robes of righteousness. How righteous are you on a scale of one to a hundred? Anybody want to answer that? You are 100% righteous. Why? Because the Bible says you have been given the gift of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How righteous is he? Think about it now. I don't have time to quote the 45 verses. Think of it this way. Here's God. Here's you. 1 Corinthians 1 says, By God's doing, you have been placed inside of Jesus Christ. How righteous is He? How righteous is Jesus? It's not hard. 100%. He has transferred His righteousness to your account you got to spend more time in the word you got to get updated on the spiritual information that's relevant and pertinent and helpful to your life we have Romans 5 says the gift of righteousness that doesn't mean I don't mess up I mess up a lot that's why it's called a gift and not wages a gift comes to you at the expense of the giver Galatians 3.27 says, For all who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You're wearing the robe of righteousness. That is God's gift to you. That is God's gift. You've got to see yourself the way God sees you. When I was a police officer, I was on duty one day. Or I might have been off duty, I forget. But I came across this woman who was on her fourth or fifth marriage. And I said, Rhonda... Would you like for me to tell you why you keep going from one man to the next and one bed to the next? I said, I can tell you. She said, I would love to know. I, I just can't find the right husband. And I've seen this. I've long since lost count. I've met hundreds of women who just went from one marriage to the next, one relationship to the next. And I know why they do it. And I said, Rhonda, let me tell you why. She said, please tell me why. I said, you, you are struck with a strong sense 
of worthlessness. You don't think you're worth anything, so you take anything that comes along. And she broke down and cried like a baby. Because most people I have met, especially as a police officer, and going to a thousand domestic disturbances and hundreds of disturbance calls and dealing with troubled people, I noticed, especially in women, there was just this strong sense of, I'm not worth a good man, or I'm not worth it. And even women who profess faith in Christ, you know, the Bible says in Hosea 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What you don't know can hurt you. And the truth is, you're a daughter of the Most High God. That makes you worth something. Right? But that's where the enemy comes in and whispers to us of our worthlessness. And that's why we end up with such low self-esteem or inferiority complexes. Or we, we hate. I've, I've met women who can't even look in the mirror, who, who despise themselves and hate themselves. Listen, honey, that's, that's not the voice of your father. That's not the voice of your father. He celebrates you. He has given you the robe of I could just run through the whole New Testament and show you over and over that the righteousness of Christ. You'll have to. I'm not knocking you. I'm not putting you down. It would defeat the very purpose. You're going to have to spend more time in this book. Do you recognize this book? I don't know. I, I go places everywhere. They don't. It's the Bible. I devour it. I spend two, three, four, five hours a day in this book. I wake up sometimes at three or four in the morning like a little child. I've been doing this for 50 years. You learn from Him. This sustained me. My daughter, my daughter died the other day. In my arms, I lost my oldest daughter. And the only thing that sustains me, the only thing that has kept me going is to rise up early in the morning and pour over this book until I'm flat drunk with it. Anybody with me? You'll have to spend as much time in this book as you do surfing the net, texting and Facebooking and all of the other worthless things you do, watching the news, getting up to watch Fox News. May God save us from Fox News. Let me just go on record right now. Save us from Sean and Tucker and all of them. God save us from all of them. May good morning America or whatever. Why not get up in the morning and let your father make sweet love to you? and talk to you. That's what sustains me. I get up and I cry a lot and I think of her. But I must tell you that the love and the forgiveness and the celebration that God has over me, it has sustained me because I thought I would die. I didn't think I could make it without my oldest child. I don't know why I told you that. I probably shouldn't have. I'm just, I'm here with you a few minutes and I'm just, I just want to motivate, motivate you to tune into heaven's frequency. Turn on heaven's good morning, America. Here it is. Men and women have died, shed their blood to keep this book for us. Pour over it. I read, I even, Jeremy, Jeremiah, I keep calling him Jeremy. You told me your name was Jeremy. I know you're denying it, but you're not being truthful. <laughs> Then you wanted to go with Dr. J. You are not Dr. J. <laughs> Driving out here, I'm so addicted to it. I propped it up on the steering wheel and read it for 100 miles. I know I need to get that off my chest and confess that. And I've been doing that since 1973. I haven't done it with perfection. But this is how you hear what your father says to you. And it's more important than what Tucker Carlson has to say or Sean Hannity. God help us. This, and I am a right-wing conservative guy, but I'm also a disciple of Jesus, and what he says comes first. God is not falling off his throne. God is not panicking. God is not surprised by the outcome of midterm elections. His truth is marching on. Nobody's going to stop him. The Bible says no plot against the Lord shall succeed. On resurrection morning, the Pharisees got Pilate to authorize a Roman seal on the tomb. Basically, they glued the tomb shut, put Roman guards there, and God laughed. An angel came down and kicked it like a little football. And up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose forever from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Can I get an amen? amen. By the way, let me throw this in for you. I'm just throwing everything at you, and then I'm going to hit the road. Listen to this out of Psalms 2. 
David says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His Christ, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. In other words, the people of the earth and the politicians and the government say, God and His Christ will not rule over us. Look at the response of God. I'm reading from Psalm 2. The response of God. I just read you the first three verses. The response of God is in verse 4. Are you ready? This is God's response to all the people and politicians who say, God and Christ shall not have their way. Psalm 2, 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> Isn't that good? <coughs> he who sits in the heavens <coughs> shall laugh. God is laughing to think that men will have their way. Your Father loves you. Your Father forgives you. He celebrates you. He put that robe of righteousness on His Son. By the way, did you notice? He also put a ring on His finger. You know what the ring was? The ring was a credit card. That's how you paid your bills in Jesus' day. You wore a ring. You went to the grocery store, and the credit card was your ring. You made an impression in some kind of dirt or clay, and that was a promise to come back and pay on payday. Can you imagine this? Your son comes home. He's just blown every dime on alcohol, drugs, and prostitutes. And the first thing you do is, I'm glad you're here. I kiss you. Here, take my credit card. Isn't that the last thing you would do? You know what God has done for us in Christ in spite of our sin? Not only is He loving us and does love us and will always love us and forgive us, He restores our credit. That is, He gives us access to Him through Jesus Christ. I can always go to Him. If I've had a terrible day, if I have sinned in every way possible, or if I haven't sinned at all, I can always go in through the blood and name of Jesus. I am always welcome to come to the Father. I remember one night I was driving along in my police car. About three in the morning, freezing cold. I always kept my windows down though, so I could hear if there's any noise going on. And I was on one of my infamous guilt trips. I'd just been failing a lot, it seemed like. I'm always upset with my wife or <coughs> upset with my children. Just, I just didn't like the way I was acting as a Christian. And I had these guilt trips. They plagued me for years. And it was 3.15, freezing cold, not a soul in sight on the midnight shift. There in my police car. And I remember coming to a stoplight and I just stopped. And I just thought, and I said this to God out loud. I bet you get so tired of coming to me and having to cheer me up. And I dropped my head on the steering wheel. I did not expect a response, but I got one. You know what he said? Son, it never bothers me to come and pick you up. And it was almost out loud. It happened again a few years later. I was at a stop sign. Things happen to me at red lights and stop signs. I was on another guilt trip. On my way to see my in-laws, they were missionaries, and I was going to see them, they were home on furlough, and I was by myself, and we were getting together for lunch. A block or two from their house, I stopped at a stop sign. A block or two from their house, and I said, God, how do you stand to even look at me? I expected no reply. You know what he said? Son, I see the finished project. Excuse me, I see the finished product. I see the finished product. I see. I see where I'm, God's got big vision. Right? He sees the final moment in time. He knows when the end will come. Could be today, could be a thousand years from now. He sees it. He sees where He's taking you. He loves you. He forgives you. He has clothed you with the robe of righteousness. He has put a ring on your finger. And you are not. The Son expected to be a servant. Did you know God has no servants in the kingdom? Are you aware of that? Paul said to the Galatians, from henceforth you are no longer servants, but sons. We are his sons and daughters. The servants live in, out by the outhouse. We live in the palace with the king. We are sons and daughters. We are sons and we are daughters. I shared this this morning. I'll share this and then I'll close. <coughs> I once read a story in a one of the greatest books I've ever read. Jeremiah, you ever read that book? I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. J, have you ever read this book? Uh, What's so amazing about grace, Philip Yancey? Anybody like to read in the room? <coughs> One of the greatest books I've ever read. Finished it driving down the highway, I confess. What's so amazing about grace? 
30 years ago. Philip Yancey tells a story of a young girl named Susan. That's the name I'll give her. She lives with her parents. She's about 15, 16 year, years old. And they live in Traverse City, Michigan, where all the cherry trees are and beautiful in the fall and what have you. And she's been having some trouble with her parents. So one night when she goes to bed after having another argument with them, she decides to act out a plan she's been working on for quite some time. When everybody goes to sleep, this little teenage girl, Susan, sneaks out of her window, sneaks out of the house, gets on a bus, and goes 60 miles away to Detroit. Her parents are going to wake up to this horror the next morning. No sooner is she in the bus station than she is approached by a very nice man. You know where this is going, right? He's a pimp, a trafficker, human trafficker. He's real nice to her. Uh, she befriends him, and she's very grateful. Next thing you know, he's got her living in this beautiful apartment with all this beautiful furniture, plenty of food, all the clothes, her life. All she has to do is turn tricks for men. She lives the life of a prostitute. And because she's so young and beautiful, she makes a lot of money doing this. Well, time goes on, and that kind of lifestyle comes back to haunt you, does it not? She contracts a disease, and she gets sick. Now she's gotten where she looks older. There's nicotine stains on her fingers, and she can hardly stand the sight of herself. So her boss comes along and says, hey, sorry, you're out. And he throws her out on the cold streets of Detroit. She sleeps in the alley at night. Sometimes for cover, all she has is newspapers. One day she's at the store buying some groceries to eat. She looks up at a milk carton, and there's her picture on the milk carton with the caption, Have you seen this child? It scares her. Days pass. She grows more and more miserable. And then one night she wonders, I wonder if I could go home. She thinks it over a few days. Finally, she musters up the courage to call home and ask if she could come home. But the answering machine comes on, so she hangs up. She sits and thinks about it for a few moments and then puts a couple of quarters back in the machine or in the payphone and then calls her house. The answering machine comes on. It's her daddy's voice. And she says, Dad, Mom, it's me, Susan. I was thinking about coming home. I'll be at the bus station in Traverse City tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. If you're there, wonderful. If you're not, I'll just keep going. I understand if you don't want me. She hung up the phone. And for the next 24 hours before she got on the bus and all the way there, she had to wonder, did they catch the message? She's cruising down the road. It's a snowy night. She looks out the window. It says Traverse City, 16 miles. She gets out her little compact mirror, looks at herself. She's so disgusted with how old she looks and the cigarette stain, nicotine stains all over her fingers. She's so nervous. She keeps asking, I wonder if they got my message. And then she keeps rehearsing what she's going to say. Finally, the driver of the bus comes on and says, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're now pulling into Traverse City. We'll be here 15 minutes. 15 minutes, and then everybody needs to be back on. And we're headed to Canada. Susan thinks 15 minutes. Wow. She gets off the bus, and she starts walking toward the terminal. She walks in the terminal, and of all the sights that she had imagined in her brain, she sees one that never came to her mind. Forty people standing next to each other, wearing goofy party hats, blowing those goofy little horns, shouting and screaming, Welcome home, Susan! She is shocked. There's her brother, her sister. Grandma, Grandpa, even a great-grandfather, her cousins, aunts and uncles, friends from all over town, 40 of them, singing and shouting. She looks up on the wall in the bus terminal. There's a big old computer-generated sign, Welcome home, Susan! She is shocked and overcome by this incredible loving reception. reception. All of a sudden, guess who comes walking out of the crowd? Who would that be? Who she dreaded seeing? Her daddy. Daddy comes walking out of the crowd. He gets up close to her and she says, Daddy, I'm so sorry. And then Daddy takes his hand and puts it over her mouth. Child, this is no time for apologies. We have a party to get to. That is the heart of your father. That is the heart of your father. He loves. He forgives. He celebrates. I'm not saying... You're free to go out and sin. That's not. Sometimes I get accused, well, you just think we can do anything we want to do? I sure do. I believe I am free to do whatever I want to do, and I will go do it. Now, you may have a hard time with that and say, well, that doesn't sound right. 
well, maybe you, before you judge me, you should ask me what I want to do. Because you know what I really want to do? I want to heal every broken heart in the United States. I would love to go to hospitals where sick kids are and lay my hands on them and raise them to life. Anybody with me? If I could do what I wanted to do, I wouldn't go live in adultery or feed my flesh. I would go out here and turn this world around for Christ. And I guarantee you, the people in this room that are blood-bought and born again, if you were really liberated and freed, captivated by this loving, forgiving, partying-type God, you too would go out and determine to do all the good you can with the time that you have left. Because that's what's in our hearts. The love of our Father. In what we would choose more than anything. And to say as Jesus said. I delight to do thy will. I'm done Dr. J. I got a long drive. I need a chauffeur is what I need. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Can I pray for him? Is that okay? <coughs> Let's pray. Well, what are you doing? What are you bowing your heads for? Did you know there's not one command in the New Testament to bow your heads and close your eyes? Why do you do that? That's a religious tradition started some time ago. Jesus never did it, except in the Garden of Gethsemane he fell face down. Most of the time in public when he prayed, every time he held his head up. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he prayed. The Bible says he looked toward heaven. In the Gospel of Mark, before he healed the deaf mute, he looked up toward heaven. Before he multiplied fish and bread, he looked up toward heaven. John 17, his famous prayer with the Father, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Why would we talk to our Father up in heaven while looking toward hell? See how religion gets into the churches? Now, here's the glory of it. We're free. If you want to bow your heads, it's fine. You say, I do that out of reverence. That's what the publican did. The publican did that opposed to the Pharisee, but the publican, that was before he was saved. He went from a servant to a son. We are sons and daughters. You don't go to your father. Father, can I borrow the keys to the car? <laughs> father, your father, right? Jesus has made that possible. The Lord bless you and keep you. And make his face to shine upon you and give you peace and give you grace. And Father, I pray that you would just bless the stuffings out of this church. Jeremiah and his wife and the leadership. I just pray that Courtside Alliance Church would have tremendous impact in the Courtside community. Can you agree with me on that? I pray that every time they speak or have an activity and, and they invite people, I pray, Father, they would be winsome and spiritually attractive, that people would be drawn here to hear the story of your love and find their place in your family and in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, everybody shout it. Thank you for listening, folks. I've got to hurry up and get home so I can watch the Cowboy game. Starts in four hours. This is a really good song to be able to finish his message because he lives. He talked about how the Father loves us. The Father loves us so much that he gave us his son. And so we can face tomorrow because he lives. God sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love he and forgive he lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he Greater still.
still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he We're going to take an offering right now, so if I could, you guys receive it, um, come on up. Uh, if this is your first time here, um, we're not asking you to give anything. Um, we want you to be a part of our ministry to the community here, but you don't know about us, so, so right now, we're, we're just getting acquainted. But we are the Alliance Church, and what we are is we want everyone to hear the gospel. This guy right here, he's a Southern Baptist. He used to be. Well... You know, he's come out from among them. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's not about denominations. It's about, is Christ glorified? Amen. And do people hear the message of the gospel? And so that's our goal, is that every single person that comes through this town will hear the gospel, but our focus is on the youth, that every teenager would know the gospel, that they would hear it, and they would have an opportunity to respond. And if not, they have a seed planted for God to use. And so that's what we're here to do. Not to build buildings, not to build ministries, but to do whatever God calls us to. So I'm going to pray over this offering. So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, the, for the, the gifts that you have given us. The greatest one being Jesus. If we had nothing else, we would have everything. Because of the, of the cross. And so Lord, as... We receive this offering. Use it to build your kingdom. It's your church, not ours. Move us out of the way so that you can do your work. But Lord, we ask that you use us. Move by your Holy Spirit right now to use us for gospel work. And we praise you for all that you are, have done, all you're doing, and all that you will do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Okay, let's stand as we sing the last song. Thank you. Um, it is the cry of my heart. This may be a new one, too, for some of you, but it's, um, it's a fun song. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, and make me wholly devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Open my eyes so I can see the wonderful things that you do. Open my heart up more, O oh Lord, and make me wholly devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to worship you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. All of the days of my life. All of the days of my life. All right. Are you guys pumped up? Are you guys ready? Because a, a, uh, there's a God that loves you, as Jimmy says, so passionately. Does that not thrill you? God bless you this week. May that love not only penetrate your heart, but penetrate the hearts around you. Jimmy shared something yesterday about the heart that when it beats, it beats to everyone, right? Ten feet away. Yeah. Yeah, the waves coming out of your heart that they've found strike 10 feet away. Get close to people. I know COVID, six feet away. You can be 10 feet away and still impact someone's life. God bless you. Have a great week.